learning crypto. A commodity or a security? Without speaking to any one. I know you've okay. repeatedly it's said you're not going to speak to one, except you've spoken to one. Bitcoin. Speaking to the tokens, there's 10 to 12,000. Is Ether a commodity or a security? And again, it depends on the facts and the law. And if there's a group of individuals. I'm asking about the, the facts middle. and the law sitting in your seat and the judgment you are making. And so, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I think you, you would not want me to prejudge because I'm also. But you have prejudged on this. You've taken, you've taken 50 enforcement actions. We're finding out as we go, as you file suit, it, that uncertainty is bad, is it not? And I think that Congress has said that there's one agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission, under this committee. And you won't answer my question, and you're the head of that agency. So give me a break. Come on. Okay, so let me just step back. There is a lack of clarity here in the marketplace. Good morning, Warriors. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of your favorite crypto news channel, Good Morning Crypto, where we bring you the most relevant and impactful crypto-related topics from a top crypto research team in the world. And today, we're joined by two of my friends, Mario and Gonzo, are in the building, so I'm super excited for today's show. But I wanted to start off by showing our listeners that clip of Gary Gensler just to show our listeners how uncertain it is with the market today, whether it's Congress or you're in exchange. Nobody knows what the heck is going on. So we're going to provide some details. First of all, how are you feeling, Gonzo? And thank you for being here. I'm feeling great, man. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? I had a great weekend. Got to spend some time with my granddaughter, family, and then just, you know, still grinding. Like we've had some really good like update calls on the Mondays going over different narratives. But um, yeah, I got a little bit of correction in the market, but we'll probably show some charts later. Excited. Absolutely, guys. And everybody is red this morning, Mario. We're going to kick it straight to you for an introduction, except for the Litecoin holders out there. So shout out to the Litecoin community. Believe it or not, guys, I prepared a Litecoin chart for today's show as well. So that's going to be something you want to stick around for. First of all, Mario, how are you feeling this morning? And thank you for being here. Good morning. I am feeling great, Abs. Thank you for asking. I'm super excited to be here. I had a pleasure of being on with Gonzo on the Spanish side and about an hour ago, or two hours ago. Uh, so now we're here and it is an exciting day for Litecoin, but also Bitcoin Cash. Guys, the Bitcoin Cash having is like in the next 24 hours. So Bitcoin Cash is pumping pretty hard. I'm excited about that. That's an interesting detail too, Mario, because one of the top performing tokens over the last 14 days is Bitcoin Cash. And I don't people, I don't think people are have like immense demand for this product, but we are seeing a ton of people buy it in anticipation for the having. And we already got 503 live listeners joining us. Show us some love smash that like button. I'm going to briefly tell you the prices for today, and then we're going to get into some of our exciting articles. When we check out our Merlin market update, it is a red day. Bitcoin is down nearly 4%, but the rest of the market is down about 5% across the board. We're sitting at 2.48 trillion in total market cap. Bitcoin is 52% dominant. Ethereum is about 16%. We've got Bitcoin sitting at 65,900. And let me just pause for one second there, guys, because if you look at Twitter and you see crypto Twitter, People are pretending like this is a horrific day. We're still sitting at $65,900. Ethereum is $3,300. BNB is $55. We've also got Solana trading at $181, down 6% on the day. And XRP back below $0.60, cents, trading at $0.59.1 cents on the daily, guys. And I want to start off the show with this interesting fact before we get into our articles, because this market could rapidly change after the Bitcoin halving. And that's what I want to remind our listeners of today, Gonzo. Let's start with you on this article because I found something very cool. Let's go to the Merlin Twitter account, guys. You're going to like this tweet, and this is why everybody should go follow at Get Merlin Crypto on Twitter, putting out great content, and we're going to provide some of that on the show today. So crypto investors, history suggests that this market is about to explode. After the Bitcoin halving, the first time, we saw Bitcoin go from $11 to $1,150, creating a 105x gain. In 2016, we saw the Bitcoin halving take the price from $650 to over $20,000, creating a 30x gain. In 2020, we saw the price go from $8,800 to $69,000, creating a 7.5x gain. And what are we seeing right now? With the 2024 halving coming into effect and Bitcoin sitting about at about $70,000. Now, I know we're at $65 this morning. We can anticipate a $175,000 Bitcoin if this math continues and we see this pattern play out before Gonzo. I also provided, you guys can see the math I did. I reduced this to only a two and a half X. Couldn't make it any smaller without giving you bad data. We can anticipate that. And the reason I wanted to go to Gonzo was because last week we broke down the 1.618, which is where that $180,000 mark. So pretty, pretty cool. But I want to kick it over to you for some TA and then we'll get into some articles. Yeah, I mean, that's a good call right there. And we know that in the previous two cycles, we have had four 
two of them, we made it to the 1618, which you're right, it's at 180,000. And then two of the other cycles, we went really parabolic, we made it to the 2618, which uh, that one's at about 500,000. So we got to take it one step at a time, but 1618 is 180. But let's see what's going on with Bitcoin, right? Like you can see what happened. We came down, this is like our trend line that we've been following, our momentum trend line that we've had since back in February of 2024. We kind of came down and you could see all this buy pressure. We bounced right off the 618, right? And then now we're kind of coming up off of it. You can see what happened. Like, I don't know why people are freaking out. If I show you the monthly, like on the monthly, it's the first time that we've closed above the all-time high, right? So on the monthly candle, this is the highest that we've ever closed. We're getting a bit of a correction. Like I said, uh, when you look at where we bounced, we bounced right at that 618. As long as we're holding this trend line, then we have the potential to keep going up. What we do need to pay attention to is the trend analysis, right? When you look at this, this is a high and this is a lower high, right? So we need to see, are we going to like break down and maybe come down further? But let's talk about altcoin because we're all altcoin heavy. You see how we made a high and then a lower high? When I show you the total three, right, which is the altcoins excluding Ethereum, if you look at it, right, if I put it on the weekly here hold on let me put it on the 12 hour uh you see how we made a high and then a low and then this is a higher high right so structurally the altcoin market not including ethereum is a little bit stronger right we made a high and then a higher high so now we got to see i think what we're doing is making a higher low in the structure in trend right this is a low high and then a higher low and so for me it's a good time to dollar cost average you can see that the, some of the narratives bounce back faster. If we look at Bitcoin dominance, this is what's been going on with Bitcoin dominance, right? Like we've been in this range and then it needs to make up his mind, right? Like if we break this resistance and this thing breaks out, then you could expect that Bitcoin's gonna run a little bit harder. And then if it corrects, the altcoins will bleed, right? But if yep. we finally come down to this support and we lose it, then the altcoin market is going to pump. Now, like I'm zoomed in right here, right? So this is what these are the first levels that we're watching, this 53% level. But when you look at it on a high time frame, you can see we're still kind of like there's the big trend and we're still kind of holding this higher structure up here. But real alt season really won't kick off. We're looking at this. Once we lose 50 and then we start losing these levels, this is really when altcoin season will really start. So something to pay attention to. But all we're doing is kind of correcting a little bit, which is healthy. And you just got to pay attention to which narratives are bouncing back quicker, which is usually deep in AI and some of the gaming projects. Gonzo, we're seeing a lot of bullish charts across the board when it comes to altcoins. We're going to talk about AVAX and Solana, a couple other tokens. But before we move on from this particular topic, I'd love for you to pull up the Bitcoin versus XRP dominance chart or whatever correspondence you think would be most valuable. Because I found this data over the weekend and it, it really stuck out to me about where we are. This is the 2016 cycle, the 2020 cycle, and where we are today in 2024, we are right at the precipice of breaking out. And this is what they call a uh, uh, Wyckoff accumulation. Look at that. See, brilliant this morning, guys. I'm on fire. And we got 1,100 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. I want to start off with all these bullish indicators because we are going to get into some more detailed topics talking about the Coinbase lawsuit. But people are here for the price action. And the alt season is confirmed on this Bitcoin breakout. When Bitcoin breaks its all-time high and is reaching to that $75,000, $80,000 range, the evidence tells us, Gonzo, that's when the altcoins really start to move. So with that being said, I'd love to kick it over to you, and then we'll get into some articles right after. Yeah, so what I'm pulling up here is the Ethereum Bitcoin chart, right? So Ethereum and Bitcoin pair, not like the US dollar. And you can see in the last cycle, we had this kind of movement where it went up and down, up and down. And we had this major support where we set the low at the beginning of the cycle. And it took a while, but we finally broke down. And this was the final flush out, right? This was the final flush out in USD Ethereum. And this is really what started kind of the climb from alt season going up. Very similar structure, right? We've had this call for like the Ethereum breaking out and doing better than Bitcoin, but it's continuously pumped and then broken down. But look where we're at. When we zoom in, we're right at that resistance level or that support level, I should say, right? We made this low back in June of 2022 when Ethereum was $800 and everyone's been watching this chart ever since. And, and we get these huge pumps where we think, okay, this is it. We're going to break out and then we correct. So everyone's watching this because once we break down here, this will be the final flush out, right? Once Ethereum Bitcoin breaks down for the final time, 
and we lose the support, I think it'll finally find its support somewhere around here and then it turns around. So this will also be the final flesh out for Ethereum USD. So when we talk about, I'll show you the, uh, you know, show me the chart and I'll tell you the news. When you talk about Ethereum and the SEC and all the craziness that's happened, that could be the final blow that breaks the support level that brings us down the final flush out in Ethereum USD where we get back down to 3000, maybe 2800, something like that. And then we climb from there because once Ethereum turns around and starts kind of going stronger against Bitcoin, it'll lead the rest of the altcoin market. And that's why we're watching it. And here's what I want to remind people as well, Gonzo, is that there's only one token in the crypto market that has ever passed Ethereum. And that would be XRP, guys. Let's check out some of the data from the previous cycles. But Mario, one of our listeners is asking you a question. We got to address the live questions. We always do that on this show. So if you have a question, ask it in the live chat, whether you're on Twitter or YouTube, both of them will pop up on my StreamYard stream. And Mario, the question that we got today is, is this the, retra the retracement that you've been hoping for? Now, I'm going to give you the open floor, but from my perspective, a 5% pullback, very, very normal. What's your perspective? Well, first of all, Node Army sending you love, my brother. But so this is definitely positive, in my opinion. Like we 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 were overly extended. We were extreme greed. Uh, the RSI levels were extremely high. You know, Gonzo is the technical guy here, so I'm not going to go there. But we needed the market to cool down. The market needed to have this sideways action, you know, corrections, come down, retest these levels. So whether it's going to be 5%, 10%, or even, you know, 30%, as we've seen in previous bull runs, I think that obviously because now we've got such a different dynamic, we've got the institutions, we have the ETFs that are driving a lot of demand. I saw that you posted something on X yesterday, Abs, about how much Bitcoin has been purchased versus the Bitcoin that's that's being mined on a daily basis. And so those dynamics, I think, are going to play uh, differently in the market. So a 5% correction of now could obviously be equivalent to the 30 of, of the previous cycles. So I definitely think that overall, this is something positive. I am happy to see us consolidate, come down, back test, because it's only reassuring uh, me that, that we're going to continue traveling up. And the only thing that I would say is, you know, worth keeping an eye on is just the timeline of the bull run. You know, a lot of people are focused on the timeline and, and us, you know, a year after the halving, that's when the top comes in. Well, we've seen a different situation this time where we've made a new high before the bull, before the, the having. So that's the only thing that I'm keeping an eye on and that I urge everyone to keep an eye on is as we go into this next phase of the bull run, once we're after having and prices start to get pretty exciting, just keeping an eye on wh what this timeline is going to be this time. Are we at an, an accelerated pace? Are we going to have a shorter bull run? Because in reality, we're moving much faster. What is that going to look like? So, but, you know, to answer Node Army's question, absolutely, I'm happy to see this pullback. Mario, let me just ask you one more follow-up before I kick it straight to Gonzo here is that I'm looking at the Bitcoin price chart and what we see after the halving every single time. And what I want to remind our listeners of is how you get killed in a bull run is by sitting on the sidelines. How you get killed in a bear market is by sitting in the market. If you're sitting here waiting for $55,000 Bitcoin before you get, you know, allocated correctly for the bull run, you may miss out. And that's why we always talk about having an exit strategy, whether you're getting into the market or leaving the market, it's important to pick specific price targets and enter regardless of your emotions. And we got 1,503 live listeners here. Show us some love, smash that like button. And we got a bunch of exciting topics prepared. But right now we're gonna talk about Ethereum and Solana and Mark Yusko's comments that he made on our show last week. So there's only one token in the crypto market that has ever passed Ethereum. That would be XRP back in 2017. Over the past seven years, we've witnessed a dramatic shift in the crypto landscape. And this screenshot kind of shows the magnitude of that evolution. Bitcoin ruled the market at $1,700, only a $28 billion market cap. XRP surged to second place, boasting an impressive $11.4 billion market cap and passing Ethereum in the process. I also highlighted Stellar and Dogecoin both breaking into the top 10. But as you can see, Litecoin, Dash, Ethereum Classic, Monero, many of these tokens are way down in the top 100. And I think that just goes to show there's plenty of opportunities out there of new tokens that will climb into the top 10 during this bull run. And hopefully we'll talk about some of those on our show. AVAX, Chainlink, Quant Networks. There are plenty of legitimate projects. I want to give a shout out to Gonzo. He's been talking about Render since last summer. Go and check out the price chart for Render, guys. That really does speak for itself. So Mario, I did, sorry, Gonzo, I did just want to get your opinion on this data here. 
Let's ask a fun question. We're keeping it lighthearted this morning because we do have some really good topics to get into when it comes to laws and SEC. Gary Gensler, do you ever think we'll see another token pass up Ethereum? It did happen in 2017 and it was XRP. Do you think there's possibility that Solana, XRP, or any other crypto does that once again during this crypto bull run? You know, it depends. Like that market cap is very, very big. Now these market caps can get really crazy. And so, you know, it, are, are there some projects that are in the top five that can balloon up and, and catch up to it? I don't know. That, that, that's a pretty big market cap. Um, you know, even Solana with the run that it's had, its market cap is what, like 60, 70 billion or something. You're talking about 500 billion. So in, in market cap, uh, I, I don't know about that. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're like, you were just talking about like the opportunities uh, to note armies thing. I just want to make a comment. If you look at some of the altcoins, look at what narratives are like bouncing back really strong, right? Because that's going to give you an indicator of which projects are going to do well as alt season pops off. And a lot of like the gaming projects is right now, RWA is kind of the hot thing, but they're returning back to these really good support levels, right? We talk about Miria. Miria is coming back and retesting its previous all time high, right? It had been up for a long time and now it's coming back down. There are other projects like, you know, you talked about Render. Fluence, FLT is a project that's decentralized, it's deep in, decentralized GPU and CPU, right? That project is bouncing back already. It's up 6% off of its bottom. Again, another project that kind of is new, but it kind of went back down to its previous, I don't want to say it's all-time high, but where it kind of released, it pumped really hard, and now it's coming back to retest the support. So pay attention to those things because there's opportunities everywhere in the market. And that's what I want to highlight on our show. We're talking about the Bitcoin momentum because that's going to drive tons of new liquidity into this market. And many of our listeners are going to benefit, whether you hold Render, Quant Networks. I actually went through some data last night. And think about this, Gonzo. In order to be a top 100 crypto project, you now need over a billion in market cap. You can be up to 115th in market cap and you're still worth a billion dollars. Give me some quick comments on that and then we'll move forward into our articles. I'm sorry, I got distracted by Mario's comment. What did you say? <laughs> no, I said uh, to be a top 100 project right now, you need yeah. over a billion dollars in market cap. And I think that just goes yeah. to show how quickly this market's changed because you can be out of the top 100, like even an XDC, a legitimate project with real developers, real use cases, tokenizing ownership rights for banks. Like that's a huge project. That is like 150 right now. So there is so much money in this space we're seeing a, a massive change. Floor is yours, Oh, on. yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're going to see this. All you have to do is you can go to Coin Market Cap and you can go to the snapshots of the top projects, the top 100 of the previous cycle, and there's going to be a rotation, right? The the three strong narratives. Look, and I don't, I don't talk a lot about ISO tokens because my ISO bags are packed, right? I'm looking for other opportunities. But the three strong narratives that we've had that have been consistent has been deep in with AI part of that. It's been GameFi and now real world assets is kind of coming into there. Now we're very early with real world assets, right? So what you're taking is proxy bets. You have like these new blockchains that are coming out, layer ones, which is the base of all blockchains that are built specifically for RWA. And then you have other proxy bets, right? That are starting to tokenize treasury bonds that are offering yields to institutions. Those projects are kind of like the GameFi and metaverse projects of last cycle where people are speculating. It's a very strong narrative but we still don't know where that infrastructure is. And without regulation, we don't know what's gonna survive, but there's money to be made and that narrative is gonna be very strong. So you're gonna see those narratives that are maybe outside of the top 100 start to creep into the top 100. If they're in the top 50, they'll go even higher, right? These market caps can get very, very big when, um, when you're in the middle of the frenzy of a bull run. And that's why we always talk about a small piece of your portfolio should look a little bit further down the risk curve, smaller market cap tokens where you put a little bit of money and then if they hit, they balloon up very big and the price goes up. 100% Gonzo. And we got 1,853 live listeners joining us. Show us some love, smash that like button. And I think we're pulling up a comparison between abs and little Dicky right now. Listen, guys, I'm not going to say we're related, but we may have a distant cousin according to this picture. And that's all I'm going to say on this topic, Mario. So let's get into some more serious articles here. As 48 U.S. lawmakers have asked the SEC's Chair Gensler whether to classify Ethereum as a security, and they're warning about some of the implications of if Ethereum is considered a security. Mario, I'm going to kick it to you first after I read the details on this article. So members of Congress want to know whether Ethereum is classified as a security. And for any of our listeners who are just joining the program, 
we opened up this show by showing you uh, a Congress member questioning Gary Gensler and Gary Gensler would do anything but make a definitive statement on Ethereum. This could be why. So stick around and let me know your thoughts on this article. 48 U.S. lawmakers have sent a letter to the SEC chairman's Gary Gensler last week regarding the potential of Ethereum being classified as a security by the SEC. In their letter, Congress members raised concerns about the classification of Ether, particularly following the announcement of Prometheum Inc., that is a subsidiary that would offer custody services of Ethereum to its institutional clients last month. The letter was signed by 48 U.S. lawmakers, including Patrick McHenry, French Hill, Dusty Johnson, Tom Emmer, Warren Davidson, and Glenn Thompson. They explained that both the SEC and the CFTC have long recognized Ethereum as a non-security digital asset or a digital commodity. And in October of 2023, the SEC also approved nine exchange-traded ETFs, sorry, exchange-traded funds, also known as ETFs, that provide exposure to Ethereum through CFTC-regulated Ethereum commodity futures products. Let's make something very clear before we finish the article. The SEC approved the Ethereum ETF futures product after the proof-of-stake transition. So they knew about the proof-of-stake and they still approved this product. Despite the history of recognizing Ethereum as a non-security digital asset, you have consistently refused to acknowledge that Ethereum is a security. That's what they told Gary Gensler. Well, let's get into some of the details of why this even matters to people who are in the market today. The regulatory treatment of Ethereum is not solely a matter of importance to the SEC, but it has direct implications to the CFTC and the commodities futures markets as well. The negative repercussions of the SEC implying or directly classifying Ethereum as a digital asset security will cascade through the digital asset marketplace, both in the short and the long term. So we can take this topic a bunch of different directions, Mario. But the one thing I'd like to preface our conversation with is that if the U.S. decides to be the only country to classify digital assets as a security, that's just going to hurt Americans. And it's going to put us at a disadvantage in this market, especially as other countries continue to develop real regulation. I'd love to hear some of your open thoughts. Then we'll go straight to Gonzo before I give my take. Yeah, you're right, Abs. It's going to hurt Americans and it's going to do the exact op op the exact opposite of what the SEC is supposed to do, which is protect investors. Um, they've done nothing but create more confusion. And this confusion only, you know, it tends to get worse, unfortunately, because just when you think you've seen everything come out of the SEC, it gets even more confusing. So as you stated, they, they approved futures, e futures ETF products, but now they're trying to claim that Ethereum is a security. So everybody's questioning, you know, whether the, the spot ETF is going to get approved. Um, I think that it's safe to say that under the rule of, of, of Gary Gensler, things are not going to become any clearer. It's only going to potentially get worse. The good news is that we don't have long left, you know, for that, for that, for Gary Gensler to, to be done with, with the SEC. Now the question is, is the agenda going to carry on over to the next administration? Because I really feel like the Gary Gensler came into, into the position and he's just been fulfilling the agenda. Um, you know, when you play videos like the ones that you, the one that you showed at the very beginning of the episode where he's being asked clear, concise questions and he's not answering them, he's refusing to answer. That's exactly uh, what, in my opinion, demonstrates that that agenda. It's him having his own opinion and you can tell he's he can't answer. He doesn't want to answer or he's not allowed to answer. So unfortunately, you know, this is a situation that we're, we're at in the United States. Again, I know we've talked about this on the show and I mentioned it this morning on Good Morning Crypto. The problem is not so much these assets being considered securities. I think the biggest issue here is, is not having regulation and an understanding of if it is a security, then what are the steps? What is the, what is the clarity? How do exchanges register? How do us investors register? How can we, you know, go along the right path? Uh, because, you know, turning around and calling things securities and then um, not will be really willing to work with, these companies and with these exchanges and then turning and, and, you know, filing a lawsuit, that's not really the right way to go about it. And it's actually hurting investors more than it is protecting them. And Gonzo, we know there's benefits to there being no, no rules of the road. Cause then you can decide who's breaking the law and who's not breaking the law. And I think a great example of this is what we're seeing with JP Morgan right now. JP Morgan is privately. And now I guess publicly, cause they made a statement over the weekend developing blockchain technologies. And they said they've been doing it for over 14 months. So while we've got some companies like Ripple having to pay over 200 million stifling innovation in the US, we've got other countries like JP Morgan that are allowed to work on these technologies 
and there's a lot that can be said, but I'm going to kick it to you before I, you know, go off on a tangent here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're building confusion almost like on purpose. You got Gary Gensler who won't answer it directly, but kind of leans into that. It's a security just as off, just as soon as uh, not soon, but as of just a few weeks ago, when the, the, they came after the founders of the KuCoin for the same thing they did with Binance, right. For like, um, for money laundering kind of laws things in that in that order they called ethereum a commodity right the cftc has come out on record and said that ethereum is a commodity it's the sec that causes the create the the confusion so within our own government right here in the us they can't decide on whether it's a commodity or it's a security now blackrock isn't going to be filing for an ethereum spot etf it didn't think that they had a good chance to get it approved like he was saying, I don't think he really cares whether it gets ruled as security or not. They'll work around it. We're going to get our answer here coming up in May if it gets denied or approved. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets denied. They crash the price, they tank it, and then they pack their bags and then they approve it at some point because it's going to get approved. They have a futures product. What they're probably going to have to like, what, what he'll probably hang his hat on if he denies it, it's going to be the proof of stake and the staking part of it, the yield part of it, how that gets played out. But eventually we're going to get a spot ETF for Ethereum, right? Whether we get it here in May when it gets approved or it gets approved later on, um, I think it's going to happen. But right now, like Mario said, until we get regulation, you're going to get this like back and forth. And because you get back and forth, you get volatility in the price action. Agreed. Agreed, Gonzo. And I think one of the things our listeners all know, because if you watch the show, we say it almost every episode, volatility creates opportunity. That's a rule at these hedge funds, whether you're going 20% up or 20% down, you can make money in both directions. And that's what we're kind of seeing in the crypto market today, a transformation into this new age where big companies are making money off crypto. And some of the retail investors are benefiting in the process. We got 2,217 live listeners here. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday. Show us some love. Smash that like button. I, I got to read this tweet. I want our listeners to let us know in the live chat what you think about Charlie Gasparino in particular. We're going to read two tweets from this weekend and digital asset investor put this on his account. He said, Jay Clayton was ultimately a JP Morgan asset. I wonder who their media assets are. Well, let's see Mr. Gasparino's statements. And then I guess we don't have to give our opinion. We'll just point to the evidence here. A reminder to the XRP community, he tweeted out on Friday, so far, two federal judges, including one, considered the dean of corporate law judiciary, have scoffed at the arguments using Judge Torres' ripple ruling as precedent because the ruling itself is so incoherent. No one can guarantee the ruling gets thrown out and the XRP is declared an unregistered security, but the signs are there that her legal analysis is faulty. So Gasparino making some bold statements here. Breaking. This is the, 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 the day before this tweet. Breaking. Securities lawyers say the federal judge's ruling against Coinbase should be a warning to XRP holders that Judge Torres' ripple analysis is likely to be reversed by the federal courts. The reason? Judge Fila rejected Coinbase contention that Torres' ripple ruling supports its case to dismiss. Instead, Fila relied on Rakoff's analysis on Terraform, which also rejected the Torres' analysis. Here's the official ruling. So here's my take. It's easy to be negative, but the uncertainty is clear. I don't want to pretend like this is super optimistic for the XRP community. We are debating these things, and there is a possibility that a federal judge could overrule, but I'm not the right person to speak on this. So I got some Stuart Alderati tweets that I'm going to pull up. I just wanted to get some thoughts from you, Gonzo. What's your initial reaction to Charlie Gasparino being a constant critic of XRP? And do you think any of his arguments are valid here? You know what? He, he's constantly going to kind of do that. You know, I, look, this thing has to still play out in court. You know, could the price go any lower? Like we're, we're almost already like at support, right? And so at some point, like when you look at the previous data and like you said, I'm like the technical guy and I look at charts all day. I'm not really worried about XRP because XRP doesn't tend to blow up until Bitcoin has like broken its all time high and is like pumping almost making a new all-time high. That's when the liquidity flows in XRP. That's what it's done in the past. So I'm going to go with that. I'll start to worry and pay attention when Bitcoin's like at its all-time high and rolling over and XRP hasn't done anything. But until then, I've got my XRP bags packed and I'm looking for other opportunities um, you know, to kind of ride this market and maximize my gains. And Mario, the evidence kind of speaks for itself right here. I'm going to leave this on the screen while you give your response. Back in 2017, XRP, remember this guy's Litecoin, the only one moving this morning, and XLM 
are repeating the 2017 crypto cycle. And I did stutter over my words, but you understood what I'm saying. A lot of the evidence points to something similar to what we saw in 2017. And all three of these tokens had historic bull runs. But I'll just focus on XRP. 70,000% gain in 240 days. Never seen before. Never been seen since when it comes to the legitimate projects in the crypto market. Yeah, if you bought Shiba Inu and you happen to get lucky, that's a different type of conversation. But to see a project like XRP pass Ethereum, remember we showed that stat as well, Mario. The evidence is there that we're going to see much of what we've seen before at the end of the cycle, after Bitcoin breaks its all-time high and Ethereum is creating new all-time highs. That's when so that's when projects like uh, XRP, XLM, Algorand, Quant Network, many of the laggards in the market have these humongous gains. That's why I want to prepare our listeners for it. The worst thing you can do is give up hope right now because we are very, very close to a moment that's kind of make or break. And we're not pro promising any price action. We're just showing you the charts and kind of reporting what we're seeing. There's no personal bias here. We're staring at price charts. So floor is yours, Mario. Let me know some of your thoughts and then we'll get into our next article. Yeah, I think Gonzo was spot on when he mentioned the, you know, the kind of the XRP timeline with, with regards to Bitcoin. And I think that, you know, it. I understand why people get frustrated. Like, I'm not going to lie. There's a bit of frustration in me from, you know, having XRP as one of my biggest holdings and seeing so much of the market move and XRP still hasn't. But the people that believe in the theory of us being in a bull run because we're somewhat, you know, mimicking previous cycles, then you, if you believe that, and if that's what your your uh, thesis is, then you can't discard the idea of XRP also not being part of the cycle. So if you believe we're in a bull run and we're we're copying a cycle, then XRP still hasn't done its thing. And I think we're coming up to in the next six months, we're coming up to a phase of the bull run where we can see, you know, if XRP is really going to be missing out or not going to participate or not going to have, you know, exponential gains. But I think at this stage, it's still a little bit too early. We know from, from previous cycles that XRP likes to move last. It, it doesn't usually move first. In the last cycles, we saw coins like Ethereum Classic. I mean, Ethereum Classic was lagging behind tremendously and it still went on to do a 10X. So like this cycle, we're starting to see Bitcoin Cash. And the reason why I'm bringing these up is because they're OG coins. They're coins that we can, you know, we can track a record back to, to like, like almost almost 10 years to the same time frame of, of XRP. So I think it's, I get it. I get the frustration, but I think it's it's still not the right time to be, you know, throwing in the towel, to be deciding or, you know, feeling that XRP is not going to do something. And as I said, as we start to analyze this market, depending how fast it tends to, it's going to move. I mean, it's been moving faster, but how much, how fast it continues to move. Then at some point, there has to be a decision made for me specifically. There's going to have to be a decision made on XRP. But I think right now we're still in that we're still in that right moment. So we just have to give it time to play out. And we are going to get into an article, Mario, where FedNow and Ripple are connected and we have some evidence due to the uphold transactions. Guys, we got over 2,513 people here. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday. If you're enjoying the show, show us some love, smash that like button, and also give a shout out to Gonzo and Mario this morning for always making time for us. Let's talk really, really briefly about this topic before we get into some more important ones. Sam Bagman fried speaks out after his sentencing. I never thought what I was doing was illegal. And for anyone who doesn't know, this is the co-founder of FTX who was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison after the financial crimes that he committed. I guess this is his statement. I did see it was put out on April Fool's. I'd like to preface it, but there was no there was no pullback from the person who reported this saying, oh, it's an April Fool's joke. Supposedly, these are legitimate statements from Sam Bankman fried Gonzo, just give me some really brief comments here. First of all, what's your reaction to the sentencing as well as his statement? I never thought what I was doing was illegal. I thought people could legally steal money. I'm just kidding. Well, I mean, <clears throat> look, he didn't create the system. He was copying it, right? What caught him is the same thing that caught Bernie Madoff. It was a bear market, right? What's the saying that they always say? When the tide pulls out, you see you swimming naked, right? So I think in his head, he thought that he could make these moves, do all this stuff. And when the market turned around and bounced and all the money came back, he would be able to kind of replace it and kind of cover everything that he'd been doing. But he got caught in a bear market, right? Thank God for us. Because imagine how big the collapse would have been if we wouldn't have caught FTX for what it was. And it continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then maybe in the next bear market, it came collapsing down what it would have done to the market, right? 
But I'm sure when you look at all these different exchanges and their assumption points, and we're going back a couple of different cycles, I'm sure a lot of them were doing different things that were shady and moving customers' assets and all those things. And as they got more stable and as they got more less speculative, they got a little bit more um, on the up and up, right? It's what we talk about with USDT, right? When they first started out, did they have what they said they have? I don't think so, right? But they're so big now and then they have so much money that they've probably stabilized. And so he, I don't think that he created it. I think he was trying to copy it and he got caught on the wrong side of the trade basically. But that was good for us, right? Because it created such a such a, um, a crash in the market that if you had conviction and you were here in the space, it caused great entries, right? We had never broken the all-time high before in previous cycles for Bitcoin. That was at 19,000. And we pulled back down to 16.8. Now look, people got hurt and that sucks. But when you look at um, some of the assets that they had, I think that they're going to end up making people whole, right? Because they they had some investments in that AI project that absolutely took off. So as long as like the money doesn't go all to the attorneys, which sometimes usually happens, people are going to make whole, are going to be made whole, or get bigger chunks back than they did, let's say in Celsius or some of the other uh, pro, uh, other companies that collapsed. I, I think FTX has more money to give out, but it's just going to take more time. Um, so I'm not surprised that he that he thinks that way because in his head he probably think that he wasn't doing anything illegal especially where he was at but you know in our eyes it was absolutely illegal but like when we talk about like the wild west and then when you're creating things when you don't have regulation those are the things that happen and that's why you know we need some kind of rules i'm not saying that we need to be over regulated but if we had some type of guidelines then he wouldn't have been able to go offshore and then maybe it would have been here and it would have been like what happened with ftx in japan right because of their regulation those people were protected and they were made whole the fastest because they had regulation that protected them. I agree, Gonzo. And I think that's a great take when you talk about the aspect. It goes well beyond FTX. And you make some great comparisons to Bernie Madoff. We got 2,606 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. We are now going to talk about the connections between Ripple, FedNow, and Uphold. Let's start off with some data from this man, Chad Steingrabber on Twitter. Secretly, Ripple payments have been connected to FedNow and Uphold is using it. This is a tweet from March 19th, 2024. Here's the new data we're presenting this morning. Crypto Value Hunter on, and I'll follow this guy because I really like this tweet. So shout out to this man. I just sent money from Uphold to my bank using XRP. The transaction took place almost immediately. But to my surprise, look who settled the transaction. If a picture were worth a thousand words, then you would know what this means. FedNow credit slash FedNow deposit from Uphold was used settling XRP. And let's just go back to Chad Steingrabber because I think he makes this very simple. Ripple payments is connected to FedNow service and running bank deposits for Uphold instantly. XRP is being used for domestic transactions. Really, really great data when you talk about real world use cases, and what we should be looking for when it comes to XRP. Let's just remind our listeners, if we see, if we see a situation where companies like Uphold are using XRP for instant settlement, that is one of the best, most positive narratives that we could get during this bull run. And we're kind of seeing some evidence for it now. I want to remind our listeners, we are going to let Gonzo do a little TA and cover the price chart here when it comes to XRP. But let's start off with this conversation, Mario. We'll start with Mario and then we'll go to Gonzo because we'll go into the TA. As we're reading this data, first of all, what's your initial reaction? Ripple Payments is connected to the FedNow service, but this tweet is what's more important. He sent money from his uphold to his bank using XRP. It was settled immediately and it was used by FedNow. Floor is yours, Mario. So Abs, um, just to clarify, is is the evidence or the facts in, in that tweet, the, the the idea that we know Ripple payments is connected to FedNow? Because it's it doesn't say Ripple anywhere. But if I can add to that, a couple of weeks ago, I transferred money from Kraken to, to a bank account. And they also have a FedNow option. And the money was in my bank account within 30 minutes. So maybe that's a system that Kraken is also using. It's not just, just uh, Uphold. But I mean, we know that the financial system is severely outdated. And so I think that this this all this stuff is, is uh, long overdue when it comes to you know financial financial payments and the speed of financial payments. Um, I think that, you know, it's not by by chance or by coincidence that Ripple was chosen to be sued by the SEC. I think that it's not by chance that the biggest banks, the biggest financial institutions are partnered with Ripple. 
um, all this FUD is surrounding XRP. You know, who knows? Gonzo likes to talk about the catalyst for XRP being that that um, documentary that gets released on Netflix. You know, who knows? It could be a combination of of that as well as you know the lawsuit coming to some sort of conclusion, as well as news about uh, you know more partnerships with with Ripple or just partnerships that have been going on with Ripple, but Ripple hasn't disclosed them because of the whole litigation in the U.S. So I think that. Some oftentimes, you know, they say that in the biggest chaos, there's there's lies opportunity. So in chaos, there's opportunity. And I think that there's a lot of chaos um, in crypto in general, but especially XRP. And so I'm trying to just look for that for that spot of opportunity in the middle of the chaos. And I think we're getting some signs here, Gonzo. I'm going to play a very, very short video here. Raul Paul talking about utility for XRP. And then we're going straight to Gonzo. Here we go. Than just owning Bitcoin or any of these other assets. And so to your point, there's a complexity of not only understanding where is usage happening, where developers, et cetera, but that doesn't always necessarily translate to the best returns either. So you have to really balance some of these things and, and, and kind of think through that complexity. I mean, XRP is another one. It has use. There's plenty of use, but it's, it's not the best performing asset. It's just, it's a blockchain that gets used. Floor is yours, Gonzo, because I think that kind of plays into what we're talking about right now. Yeah, you know, it's it's the network effect, right? It, it's like what's going on. Like, look what's happening with Solana and the memes, right? And it's pushed the price action up. We haven't had that kind of event in XRP. But it comes down to, we always say, your investment thesis. What is your investment thesis? Like, are you an investor? Because if you're an investor, investments are long-term, right? Like, it's not, so if you're worried about the price action, then really maybe XRP is not the thing for you because what you're talking about is swing trading, whether that's over like a six, eight month period or just the cycle, that's really like not investing because investing is a long-term thing. That's swing trading. And so that's why we say diversification. If really, if you're worried about the price action that other projects are doing, then diversify and get into those projects, get into those narratives and make gains there. But when we're talking about XRP, you know, to me, for me, it's a long-term investment, just like Ripple is. Ripple, the company. Why did I get into Link2 and I got into Ripple shares? Because that's a long-term thing of me. They're going to go public. I believe they're going to be the Amazon of the financial system. That is a long-term play. I'm not expecting that in the next six months, eight months, year, two years, that those are things are going to pay off. Those things are going to pay off in the future. But if you want, you can show the chart and we can see what's happened with the price action, right? Uh, let me pull this up. Sorry. Uh, there it goes. Yeah. So this is not a hodl coin, right? And this is what we talk about taking opportunities to de-risk. If you're going to hold long-term and you're going to invest, then you just DCA at these bottom parts and you hold for long-term. But if you're trying to maximize, then there were times to de-risk, right? You could have de-risked up here, could have de-risked up here, could have de-risked up here, and you can get back in. These are the things that kind of waters above that's talking about when the community turned on him and they were yelling and screaming at him. But he was talking about de-risking. Why is it good to de-risk? Because it makes you less emotional, right? If you were pulling some profits off the table up here and then getting back in here and then again back here and here, then you're stacking your XRP bags. You've probably taken your initial out and you're just letting that sit as an investment and you're less emotional. But when you've just bought, maybe you bought here and just waiting for price action to get back up and you didn't DCA or lower your average or you just bought kind of down here and you're waiting, there's frustration, right? But you have to go back to what kind of investor you are, what you're trying to get out of the market. Because if you're worried about the price action and you're looking at other projects, then you should be getting into those other projects, not financial advice. But if those are the emotions that get stirred up in you, but if you're long-term, then you kind of DCA. But this is why it's important to de-risk when you can. Look at this price action. This is going back to 2017. It explodes and then it corrects. It explodes and then it corrects. It explodes and that corrects. So if we get an explosion, right? This is why we talk about exit strategy and pulling some chips off the table. If you're going to hold this long term and you want to be non-emotional about it, when this thing explodes, it might be a good idea to get at least your initial investment out so that now you're just free money and then you can let it ride for the future and see what happens. But that's why we talk about exit strategy and de-risking. And just to cover the price chart and what Gonzo is showing on the screen right now, 94 cent XRP is our last key range of resistance. And I want to talk about this. We always see the parabolic rise be much shorter than people anticipate and the bear markets be much longer. That's exactly what we're seeing right now with XRP. Breaking out to $1.90, 
I was there for this. Many people thought that was just the beginning when it came to the XRP price chart. Little did we know for the next three years, at least right now, that would be the peak of the market. So any final statements here, Gonzo, and then we'll roll into another topic. No, like you said, that make sure you have your exit plan and you know de-risk or take your initial out when this thing finally goes. And then you're, you can keep it long-term and then be non-emotional. Then you can take those profits. And if we get another bear market, if you want to, if you really believe you can buy more or you can diversify into other things, but that's why it's important to de-risk because it really takes emotion out of it, right? You're not as worried about it when you have everything tied up. The other thing you need to worry about is that if you're getting very emotional and you're getting very frustrated, you need to look at like, okay, am I over invested in this, right? Because usually when you're, when you, when you're over invested and then you're worried about if this goes to zero or doesn't go up. That means that you probably put too much money into it and you need to look at that also. Agreed, guys. That's all we always talk about diversifying in the crypto market. All of these projects don't even move at the same pace. And XRP's price chart's a great example of that. I'm going to ask our listeners this because I don't know if this person is allowed to be played on YouTube. Let me know in the live chat if you want to play this video. This is Mr. Tate and Aiden Ross on Bitcoin's power as a hedge against inflation. I'll wait for the live chat's response because we got to cover this article as well. Swift is creating a central bank digital currency platform we're going to play a very short video and then read the updated article that they released. Turns out they've been working on this technology for over 15 months, and they're going to be releasing a CBDC product in the next 12 to 24 months to interconnect central bank digital currencies. This is huge. This was rumored for a long time. Here's the evidence. 12 months away from central bank digital currencies. Here we go. Nearly 90% of the world's central banks... The global bank messaging network SWIFT is looking to create a new platform in the next year or two that will connect central bank digital currencies to the existing finance system. SWIFT, which benefits from an existing network in over 200 countries that connects more than 11,000 banks, is working to ensure different countries' digital currencies can all be used together, even if built on different underlying technologies or protocols. This aims to reduce payment system fragmentation risks. If we can plug in any number of networks into the SWIFT system, it becomes a much more scalable option for the industry, said SWIFT's head of innovation, Nick Kerrigan. During a six-month trial involving a consortium of 38 banks, the system demonstrated significant promise. The platform has the potential to streamline highly intricate trade or foreign exchange payments, offering the possibility of automation to expedite processes and reduce associated costs. So you heard it there, Mario. What I don't like about that AI voice is it's very boring. So let's go into the actual article because people probably zoned out. Swift is planning to unveil their new platform within the next 12 to 24 months that will promote interconnectedness of central bank digital currencies. Swift will likely start implementing the solution after leading economies unveil their central bank digital currencies in the next year. Swift's recent initiative comes as the majority of central banks explore government-backed digital currencies. And as cryptocurrency industry grows, Traditional finance does not want to be left behind. However, policy decisions and technological limitations are affecting the ability for CBDCs to currently thrive. SWIFT has been working on an inter interlinking solution for CBDCs over the past six months. During this time, the global banking messaging platform worked with 38 global firms during the second phase of a sandbox testing for this solution. This is the tweet right here, but we'll scroll past that and go into some other details. Swift noted that this is the largest trial ever for a central bank digital currency experiment. Let me repeat that. This was the largest known CBDC experiment in history for Swift. The experiment involved 125 users who made more than 750 transactions, and the trial helped prove that CBDC's interlinking solution could promote fast and simple trade flows. It could also promote the growth of tokenized securities markets while enabling seamless FX settlements. The timeline given between 12 and 14 months could change depending on the leading time it takes for economies to launch their central bank digital currencies. A lot of really good information there, Mario. I would love to hear your response to, first of all, Swift acknowledging they're creating and launching a central bank digital currency product. That to me tells me they're not only prepared, they're ready for this technology. Number two is there's many public blockchains that are going to be used, but can't be used till regulation. I think Swift hinted at that during this entire article. So what sticks out to you most? And then we'll continue. One of the things that's that that caught my attention is the fact that they were working on this before making it public. And that's something very important for everyone to be aware of is that whenever there's a new development, they're not going to come out right away and say that they're working on something. They're going they're going to work it 
test it, and then make the announcement. And that's going to give them the competitive edge. That's going to allow them to, you know, kind of create these things in the back room. So I don't, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, Swift is at the forefront when it comes to, uh, you know, these international, um, international transfers. So they all they're doing is, is competing and, and trying to stay at the forefront. I know that there's this thought in, in the community that they would utilize XRP or that XRP eventually would replace Swift. Uh, it looks more along the lines of Swift kind of wanting to go their own route and, and get gathering their own technology. So we'll see how that turns out. But um, I would be interested to see how they, they work or how they solve for the on-demand liquidity part of things. Uh, so obviously there's still an opportunity for XRP on that part, but yeah, I, I, I think that this is definitely the future that we're going to be a part of. We're going to be a part of digital, digital currency. Uh, CBDCs are, are obviously that first step. And unfortunately there's a lot of negative stuff when it comes to CBDCs, you know, the controlling part and the programmable part. Again, I don't think that Governments will enforce that right away. I think that that's something that could come with time. But, you know, in governments uh, or at least in in countries where the uh, citizens are still very freedom centric, I think they're going to there's going to be a very strong pushback against that part of the CBDC. So I think because governments and countries know that they're going to be slow and methodical about it, they're going to introduce the CBDC and then create some sort of events that will then trigger those programmable parameters of the of the CBDC. Yeah. Mario, we got over 3025 live listeners joining us. Thank you for being here on this Tuesday. Show us some love. Smash that like button. I love what Paul Richards said in the live chat. Long-term bag plus a short-term bag resisting temptation to add to the long-term bag. This is what I'm talking about. Have your long-term accumulation portfolio and your smaller portfolio which you're playing with. You're having fun. You're trading meme coins. Maybe you're getting to some high-risk AI projects. There's plenty of opportunity, and we're not telling people stay away from that. We're saying do it calculated, have an exit plan, have an entry plan. That's how you can be a success in the crypto market. And with 3,044 listeners here, let's cover this topic, Mario. And we got plenty of things to get into in the last eight minutes. But on-demand liquidity transactions will not increase the price of XRP. If that's And that's true. But the pool itself, the liquidity pool, will increase the price of XRP by unlocking trillions of dollars and providing liquidity. Providing liquidity will increase the price and not the transactions. David Schwartz has already stated, higher price, cheaper transactions. XRP on the private ledger will have the same price as on the public ledger. Those are both statements from David Schwartz. Let's hear about one of their sandbox trials and discuss it. Here we go. Uh, again, to tell you a story, three years ago, we actually experimented with uh, 12 banks uh, across different geographies who did not have pre-funding relationship with each other. We gave them a bunch of digital asset called XRP and asked them to use it to say, see if it works for cross-border payments as a bridge currency. Uh, they came back to us after six months and they said, look, it works beautifully, but there are we cannot use this. And there are two issues with, with this. Number one, it's highly volatile, so we cannot use it. Number two, my regulator will never allow me to use this. There is no risk waiting to this and it's too volatile. There is no way the central banks will allow me to use this. This was in 2015-16. So we went back to the drawing board and came up with a new product. Uh, as I mentioned, ODL, on-demand liquidity. And basically what that product does is, through that product, banks do not have to hold a digital asset on their books. They could leverage that product, connect with a digital asset exchange, which, mind you, is fully, ex fully licensed and supervised, and then leverage that exchange to source liquidity in real time. And because the entire transaction happens in less than 30 seconds, because of the speed of the, the ledger, uh, the volatility risk is taken care of. Boom. And I really thought that was the important statement there, Mario. There's a lot of misconceptions, but because we only have six minutes left in the show, let's just move forward. I think that video was really, really self-explanatory. Let's go back to an interview we had with Mark Yusko and shout out to the man who makes our clips. He's one of the best in the industry. I want to give a private shout out to him. I guess I'll do it after the show. But here's Mark Yusko talking about if Solana existed before Ethereum, would anybody really use the product? Each time a real life use case, and that's what I love about your, your graphic there. Look, meme coins, they're gonna, they're gonna moon, they're gonna crash, they're gonna moon, they're gonna crash. Knock yourself out, right? Gambling mostly, maybe a little speculation. There's no investing there. That's not investing. You want to invest, invest in things like Avalanche, John Wu, amazing CEO, Gun, great founder, 
you know, you want to invest in, in Ethereum. Great. Does Ethereum look, one of the things is someone asked the question I thought was great. If Saul existed first, would anyone use ETH? No. Mic drop, Mario. <laughs> and I thought I thought that was pretty funny because when I was actually watching the clip, I didn't recognize my own voice. So I didn't realize that I was the one who said no. But I stand by that statement. I think there'd be a subset of people who probably went to Ethereum based on relationships. But if Solana existed before Ethereum, I think that same Ethereum network would have probably just surrounded themselves around Solana. And that would be the, the Ethereum of today would be a way to describe that. Any quick thoughts? Because we got one more article to cover before the end of the show. Yeah, I think you're right. And I like the fact that you had no hesitation. So uh, definitely, I definitely think that obviously Ethereum has got the first mover, first mover advantage. And we know that Ethereum is not the winning technology. It's not the number one technology. But in this scenario, we know that it's not always the best technology that wins. In this case, I think that we're going to have to let time pass and we will most likely see a transition. And that transition is is going to be either Ethereum upgrading to the point where it, it does become up to par with the best technologies or just a complete migration away from Ethereum and, and Ethereum's uh, market cap and utilization just you know coming down the ranks and being taken by other technologies. Agree with you, Mario. And just before we end the show, I'd love for you to cover this topic right here. Sorry, I was just pulling up the data. I got caught off guard. This person's asking us to play Tate. You know what, guys? I'll do the people a favor and I'll play this video because what we'll do is I'll play it in important chunks and then I'll pause it and comment. Let's discuss this update of Mr. Tate and Aiden Ross breaking down the importance of, of cryptocurrencies. And the reason we we're playing this video is because this stream was seen by millions of people with the majority of them being under the age of 35. With that being said, here we go. Understand why Bitcoin exists or why it's believed to be a safe hedge against inflation. You don't understand these things. If you understand money and where it comes from, then you'll understand inflation. Then you'll understand the scam of taxes. Then you'll understand from there why Bitcoin has value at all. All right, I'm going to pause it there and let's just have a quick 30 second conversation here, Mario. What are you thinking about Andrew Tate kind of explaining the benefits of Bitcoin against inflation? He is going to go into further detail, but what's your initial reaction? Yeah, I think that so far he's bringing up good points. I mean, the reason why Bitcoin exists and is is looked at as many by many people as a hedge against inflation is, and I actually saw a chart that perfectly describes it. If you were to buy a house with Bitcoin ten years ago, and versus buying a house with Bitcoin today, the number of Bitcoin used to buy the house has gone down significantly. While on the opposite end, if you were to buy that house with dollars. 10 years ago versus now, that number of dollars is, is, has increased exponentially. So I think that that's a good point. I don't have audio apps. All the money is digitally right, controlled, so you can't spend. Wow, let me go back here because this is a pretty important clip. Here we go. Then that will lead you into CBDCs and how they're going to use that to control all of us and get to a point where all the money is digitally controlled, so you can't spend it on the things you want unless you are a and we'll pause it there because that's where again i gotta watch what's said on this show but guys we got three thousand one hundred and sixty nine live listeners here show us some love smash that like button and think about this central bank digital currencies are now a mainstream topic on platforms like this for anybody who's not familiar with streaming somebody like aiden ross will have 130 to 200 thousand live watchers when he's doing these streams and then after the fact when it's published on these platforms it goes on to get tens of millions of views. And that's why I wanted to play it on our show. The younger generation, the people under the age of 35, even the average everyday investor is now awakening to the fact that digital currencies are here to stay. And this is a great example. Only 30 seconds left here, Mario. Let me just pull up the results from our poll today. Today, we asked our listeners, which token do you believe will have the highest percentage return in 2024? 57% said XRP, 25% said Solana, 12% said Bitcoin, and only 3% said Ethereum out of the 411 votes. Any quick thoughts here, Mario, before we close it out? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would love for it to be XRP. I voted Sol just because I see there's so much hype and the, and the trend tends to, to be on Solana's side for this year. Absolutely, Mario. And if I had to pick one myself... I'll do XRP. I'm going to listen. I'm going to stick with my community, guys. And we got 3,209 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button if you enjoyed today's show. And tomorrow is a Wednesday. We'll be back and we'll see you guys in 23 hours. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. And like we always say, Warriors, ah, get your shit together, baby. Thanks for joining.